Good morning. Welcome to the school also from my side. My name is Rudolf Weber. I'm a researcher at this institute and I lead the development of Espresso. So in this presentation, I want to show the basic concepts, the very basic concepts of particle-based um, simulations, because this is essentially what we will be doing um, all through this week. So this will cover like the basic ideas, um, the like kind of interactions we have in these simulations, um, and then also some very basic um, analysis techniques, which you will be using, especially in the tutorial in the afternoon. So when we do simulations, um, we we have to be clear about what is the length scale that we that we cover, um, because of course the more details we include, um, the like the more we are limited also to to um, smaller systems because of finite computation and memory resources, and then like there's maybe an advanced topic which is multi-scale simulations where one tries to bridge between these scales, um, but that's definitely the second step. So on the angstrom length scale would have um, like um, atoms and small molecules. Um, on the nanometer scale, we would have larger molecules and, and nanoparticles. When we come to microns, there would be um, cells, larger colloidal particles, microfluidic devices. Um, and then like when the length scale becomes even bigger, bigger um, we tend to go to like engineering systems and also like um, earth science. Um, so this is the length scale where often also more continuum methods um, are applied. So I want to briefly talk about the different scales and the methods that like the governing equations that are used. Because in the end, when you set up a simulation, it means you have to make a choice about the governing equation you, you want to solve in your simulation. Um, so on the on the quantum scale, this would be the, the Schrödinger equation. Um, so that would be used to, um, to calculate, for instance, binding energies or the electron distributions, like the, the orbitals, um, the, the bond structure of molecules. Um, so these quantum, like full quantum mechanical methods can be done, but they're computationally super expensive. So like um, typically um, it would be hundreds of, of molecules. And um, there are hybrid methods so like which take some quantum details into account and then um, add in like atoms on a particle level. Um, this is, not something we will cover in this particular school. Um, when we go to slightly bigger scales, um, we come to the realm of classical atomistic simulations. Um, so these, um, these simulations technically are based on Newton's equation of motion. Of course, if you're dealing with atoms, quantum mechanics is still important. Um, but since quantum mechanical calculations are so expensive, um, what people do is basically um, find approximate interactions between the atoms and molecules, um, which kind of basically cover the, um, the the effects of quantum mechanics up to a point, and then simulate the atoms and molecules as classical particles. <clears throat> so for this um, these simulations, you would apply when uh, when chemical detail is of interest, like when it matters which particular atom is um, in which particular place. And these simulations are yeah, well established and you can do like um, uh, like millions of, of atoms with them, which is like technically a lot of particles, but in terms of actual uh, volume, still like cubic nanometers. So nothing, um, nothing very large. The main focus um, of this school will be classical coarse grain simulations. So that means we zoom out a bit further. We still use uh, Newton's equations of motion as the as the basic idea, um, um, but we apply this to systems where the chemical detail is no longer that important. Like when you're talking about um, many questions in polymer physics or colloidal physics, um, it is not so important which particular atom 
um, is, is chosen, but it's more about um, which confirmations are possible or whether or not it's charged and um, like how the size ratios are, um, what is the influence of thermal motion compared to other energies. This becomes more important than the actual chemical detail. And this means we can zoom out um, and let our particles in the simulations represent larger chunks of material. So not individual atoms, but bigger objects. And that of course means we can afford to simulate um, bigger systems for a longer time scale. So this would be used um, for many questions of, of polymer physics, um, for colloidal suspensions, um, also for, for active particles, like particles that have like um, a propulsion mechanism. When we go still bigger, um, we come to a point where maybe it's not even necessary or helpful to talk about individual particles. So if you, for instance, um, uh, really are concerned with the flow of a fluid, then like if the length scale is bigger than, I don't know, a few nanometers, um, it doesn't really matter that the fluid is made up of out of atoms or molecules, um, but you really better treat this on the continuum levels as like distributions of densities, momenta. Um, so often, especially particle-based and continuum-based simulations are coupled together um, because many problems that we deal with in soft matter physics happen in solution. So there's always a carrier fluid around. And if you want to know about the dynamics, um, then we have to also care about this carrier fluid. And for this, we use continuum methods. So even though the focus of the school is particle-based simulations, you will, will hear a bit um, about continuum methods. Um, the, the most popular ones um, probably being the finite element method. This is how this particular flow field around the moving sphere was calculated. Um, but in the school, you will be using lattice Boltzmann, which is a hydrodynamic method, which is well suited for the meso scale. So that's what we'll be using together with particle-based simulations. So the limitation of the system size in simulations is, um, is a huge concern. Like compared to any experimental system that you do, the simulation is nearly always 100 times smaller because of computational or memory limits. And uh, that has effects because um, if you put walls, um, then these, these like walls will introduce significant boundary effects, which cannot be um, neglected. So the kind of solution that we typically do is to apply periodic boundary conditions. So that means um, we basically make copies of the system and put them to all sides, as you can see, or um, spoken in other words, like everything that goes out of the right boundary comes back into the left boundary. So like rolling a sheet of paper together um, in all three Cartesian dimensions. <clears throat> this makes things slightly better because there's now no wall and all points in the simulation are mathematically equivalent. So that at least at least now there's no points close to a wall and no, no points far away from the wall, um, wall which are different from each other. However, um, there is still a finite size effect. So that, that means that um, in many cases, the interactions in the systems are so long ranged that the mirror images introduced by the periodic boundary this interact with each other. And so to rule the, out, the effect out of this, um, you will in the end for a like scientific publication, often have to run your simulation at different system sizes to prove that these finite size effects do not screw up the results that you're presenting. Okay. <clears throat> Let's come to particle-based um, simulations, like the, the, the key principles. Um, so we describe our, our simulation, our system we want to study um, as a bunch of point particles and interactions between them. And then there is either an equation of motion, which tells us how these point particles evolve over time, um, or there is a sampling scheme, which um, samples from a statistical distribution, which is consistent with thermodynamics, what these particles will do 
on average. So as you have seen, when we discuss the different length scales, um, depending on what we are simulating, um, the particle in the simulation can represent quite different things. Um, for instance, individual atoms in atomistic simulations, a small group of atoms, so like um, whatever an OH group, for instance, or a carbon with some with its appendages, like in in atomistic simulations, which have a small degree of coarse graining, um, or several monomer units in a polymer, when we do like a much more coarse grained simulations, typically we choose a, a persistence length as like one particle in the in the simulation, an entire colloidal particle, which can be even micron sized. <clears throat> And then there are a few like off-label uses. Um, um, for instance, we use particles when we want to couple larger objects to a fluid, and we use particles um, as tracers on soft surfaces, for instance, when we want to model the surface of a blood cell in a flow. So yeah, this is like not in a sense a particle that you could actually see it, but it's like um, technically used as a particle um, to couple different aspects of the simulations together. OK, so we have the particles and have chosen what they mean. Now we have to do something with them. And uh, let's first talk about um, sampling schemes. So this is for the case where we are not interested in the time evolution, but in the average behavior, like in the ensemble average of the system. So for instance, what is the I don't know, average energy, the average um, coordination number of, of a particle, these questions, which don't really depend on time, but are just averages um, um, in the thermodynamic ensemble. So these methods are called Monte Carlo methods in uh, connection with the, with the casino city, um, because um, they rely on introducing random changes to the system. So the very basic idea, um, is that you um, introduce a change to the system um, and make sure that the changes you introduce and either accept or do not accept um, are consistent with the thermodynamic ensemble. For instance, with um, with the canonical ensemble, that means that like at the constant temperature. Uh, you will not learn something about the time evolution of the system from these methods. So the most basic algorithm for doing this is the Metropolis algorithm. Um, you introduce a um, um, random change into the system, observing detailed balance. Um, and if that change lowers the system's energy, you keep it. If it does not lower the energy but increases the energy of the system, you only keep it with a certain probability, um, which depends on the energy difference and the thermal energy. So the more the energy is increased, the less likely it becomes that this change will be um, that this change will be accepted. And the acceptance probability uh, drops exponentially, so that's like like sharply. So if you do that over and over again and make sure that you do not do not introduce um, biases with with your um, choices of random changes, you have a lot of freedom. So you don't actually only can apply changes that can happen uh, physically. So for instance, you can swap particles or um, um, rotate entire molecules. So there's a lot of freedom. And so this is as often used um, in systems which have um, complicated energy lengths, uh, landscapes where like waiting for like the time evolution to actually sample all the configuration space um, would be not so likely. Within this cool, um, you will be using Monte Carlo methods um, to model chemical reactions. So in that case, uh, the random changes means that um, particles um, change type. So for instance, um, um, like, a, like an, an, uh, um, an acid group dissociating from, um, from a polymer. So the first technique was sampling the configuration space by applying random changes and um, accepting them with a the probability consistent with thermodynamics. Mm, the second one, and this is actually molecular dynamics, um, is to simulate the system's time evolution. So in mathematical terms, this means we solve Newton's equation of motion 
um, numerically. So the steps in these simulations are basically you calculate like based on the current position of the point particles and the interaction potentials you have defined for them, you calculate the forces on these point particles. And then with these forces, you propagate the particles by a small amount of time, which is called the time step, um, to new positions. So basically you, you go through the time evolution of the system in, in very small steps. And the time step has to be um, small compared to the forces that are applied to the particles so that the resulting trajectory um, will be uh, relatively smooth. So one technicality I will mention is that when you integrate the equation of motion, I mean, there's many um, integrators for numerical uh, ordinary differential equations, which the, which the Newton equation is in the end. Um, the most basic one that everyone uh, sees is the Euler scheme and the runge kutta method. Um, but when we do phys physics um, with our differential equation, we have some additional constraints um, because like often we have tolerance to some like noise in the simulations due to numerical errors, but it, like the physics really gets wrong if the conservation laws are not observed. So if the, like if you simulate at um, constant energy, like with conservative forces, really the energy should be conserved. Um, otherwise the physics will just be too wrong. Um, and for that you use a special class of um, ordinary differential, differential equation solvers, which are symplectic integrators. So these have the mathematical property um, that they keep physical conservation laws um, approximately conserved. So there is some fluctuation, but it will always be in a limited band. It will never completely drift away. And the most basic symplectic integrator that you can think up, uh, think of is the uh, symplectic Euler scheme. So this works basically like the normal Euler scheme, but the secret is to update the velocity first. So first, like based on the um, forces on the particles, you get the acceleration. And in, uh, with the like accelerations, calculate new velocities for the particle. And then you do a position update by shifting the particle positions by a small amount um, based on the new velocities. So if you do it in this order, the scheme is symplectic. If you do it in the other order, it's not. Um, so this is scheme is um, first I, um, order accurate in the time step. Um, and it's like easy to understand. That's why I put it here. However, most molecular dynamics codes, including espresso, use second order schemes like the velocity valley algorithm um, to solve the uh, the Newton equation. Because that like at only slightly more effort um, gives significantly better accuracy. So we have talked about what particles represent and uh, how we propagate them or we sample the configuration space with them. Um, up to now, we have just said, okay, there are interactions between those particles, um, but we should talk a bit more about those now. So um, basically when we do simulations, um, the most decisive criterion on the like technical side um, is how the force is calculated. So first there's there's like forces which just um, are calculated for each particle separately. So for instance, if you call, calculate the effect of gravity or an external magnetic field, you can do this for each particle individually. You have to know nothing about other particles. So this is obviously technically the most um, the most easy ones and for, um, in consequence, they are also computationally like cheap to do. <clears throat> um, then there's bonded forces. So these forces, only act between specific pairs or triplets of particles. So think for instance about a polymer chain. Um, for the chain to stay a chain, you have to make sure that particles which are neighbors to each other stay together. And for this, for instance, you can use a harmonic spring between neighboring particles. So this is the harmonic spring or another um, common one is the Fini potential, which is starts out like a spring, but diverges if you um, pull it at a certain extent, so it cannot be stretched indefinitely. So you have these potentials, but they're only between specifically named particles. 
So basically, if you encounter a particle, you look up their bond partner, show, uh, look up where that is, and then calculate the force. Um, then the like um, uh, next category is short range non bonded forces. So these forces um, act between all particles that are relatively close to each other. So basically, you have to for each particle, you have to find all the particles in its kind of vicinity and then calculate pairwise forces between them. And um, doing this in an optimal fashion decides about the performance of a molecular dynamic code. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you have, like in theory, like each particle could interact with everyone else. So there would be n square interactions, which is, of course, undoable for millions of particles. Um, but the name short range suggests that actually the potentials drop fast enough that you can only like that you can ignore particles which are far apart from each other. And the most um, important one is the Leonard Jones interactions, which provides like repulsion, which makes sure that the particles do not overlap. And if you wanted also some um, attraction, which often like mimics the van der Waals forces. I'll show a separate slide on that in a minute. Um, so the, the Technically, often most demanding category are long-range interactions. So these are interaction um, um, potentials which de decay slowly. Um, that means um, uh, to, um, to R to the minus three or, far, or, or, um, or slower. So this is electrostatics and magnetostatics and hydrodynamics. And to calculate, calculate these forces accurately, you have to know about all the other particles in the system. So this is in the end, something that you have to calculate um, collectively. And talking about periodic, periodic boundary conditions, you even have to take the periodic images into account because even they will influence um, the force on a single particle. So this is why they are called long range and they're like separate um, advanced algorithms um, to calculate them. The one we use most is called P3M and that will be explained in its own lecture, um, I guess later today. <clears throat> There's one special case which becomes um, more and more popular, um, which is machine learned potentials. Um, that is a technique where you take um, uh, quantum mechanical simulations and train machine learned um, machine learning models on them, and then use these um, to predict the forces on on the atoms. Technically speaking. Um, they are short range interactions with a rather large cutoff, um, but I put them here as, as a second, um, as a separate um, category anyway, because they become uh, like uh, very important now. And you'll also hear about them sometime this week. Okay, the Leonard Jones interaction will get its own slide because it's the um, short range non bonded potential, which will be probably in 99% of all simulations. Uh, you will run this week. Um, so it consists of two terms, um, one repulsive one, um, which um, scales with R to the minus 12, which is in the end an arbitrary choice. Like the only purpose is to have steep repulsion if particles overlap. And there's a second term, uh, which is R to the minus six, which is attractive. And this actually uh, models the van der Waals interaction. And so this is used, yeah, nearly always as the basic inter non-bonded interaction between particles. Um, now, this interaction has some parameters. In its pure form, this is the length scale sigma, which basically represents the diameter of the particles, and then energy scale epsilon, which um, which consoles the strength of the potentials. And it, like if you have an attractive potential, also the depth of the um, of the potential well. Now this is used in two variants. Um, the one is um, you actually keep the attractive part. Um, and the second is you cut off in the minimum and shift it upwards so that it ends at zero. Then you have a purely repulsive potential, which you will always also often use. Um, this is goes by the name of Weeks Chandler Anderson potential. Uh, but it's really just the Leonard Jones potential where you cut off in the minimum. So 
like to make this potential short range non-bonded, I mean, it decays fast enough, it like becomes small quickly, but to also make it technically short range, you cut it off um, at a certain cutoff distance and then shift it so that there is no jump in the energy. Um, so this, this cutoff is often chosen if you want to keep the attractive part between two and a half and four particle diameters, because at that point, like um, the interaction has become so small that it's acceptable to cut it off. And then that gets rid of the N square scaling of your molecular dynamic simulations because you no longer have to um, look at all possible pairs of particles in your simulation. Okay, we had um, particles, time evolution or sampling and interactions. Um, next, we have to talk about um, thermodynamics. So, um, I mean, the, like many experimental simulations you have um, in, like you have in the end not at um, conserved energy, but very often just other um, conserved quantities. For instance, um, you run in the con canonical ensemble that you have um, a constant temperature, um, um, you run at uh, constant pressure um, or other thermodynamic ensembles. And uh, so we have to learn about techniques which let you um, maintain these thermodynamic ensembles um, in simulations. <clears throat> and the one you will be using most um, in this school is the Langevin equation, which is the easiest method to introduce um, um, temp um, temperature into the simulation. Um, you will um, also probably work a bit in the run canonical ensemble, so where particle numbers fluctuate when you will be uh, simulating chemical reactions. Okay, so what is the basic idea of the Langevin equation? Um, at the most basic level, um, the solvent introduces um, fluctuations and friction. And so that's what you do in this equation. Um, we start out with Newton's equation of motion, where we have just like, um, like the acceleration based on the forces on the particles. Uh, when we add two terms, one is a velocity dependent friction and the other is um, um, like random kicks basically. So basically you apply um, random forces uh, to the simulation. Now physically the effect of the friction and the random kicks originate from the same effect which is collision with solvent molecules. And that is why the magnitude of those two um, force contributions are related. So this is a famous result in theoretical physics. It's called fluctuation dissipation theorem. And one application of that theorem is that it gives you a relation um, between the friction in the velocity dependent friction between the friction coefficient um, and the noise amplitude um, that you put into the random kicks. So um, one important thing to no note is that the noise and the friction is uncorrelated between different times and between different particles. So this is all a single particle um, description, um, which means that it will make sure that the single particles observe, for instance, the Maxwell-Boltzmann velocity distributions and like other like correct thermodynamic behavior, um, but it will not correctly resolve any hydrodynamic solving effect, sol uh, solution effect, which comes from a hydrodynamic coupling between different particles. So, I mean, you know how it is with the, with the um, bicycle racing, they, they go into the, um, like into the shadow of each other to, to save air resistant. That's a hydrodynamic effect um, that also exists on smaller scales, uh, maybe in different fashion, but it's absolutely relevant. And this is not covered by the Langevin equation. So if you need that, you have to actually care about the hydrodynamics. To illustrate that point, I will show um, a simulation, which you will also recreate in a tutorial this week, um, where we let particles sediment under gravity. 
once only with the Langevin equation and once um, with full hydrodynamics. And you will see that it's quite different. So like this demonstrates that like if you really have a situation where the flow matters, um, the Langevin equation is not good enough. Okay, so we, um, we have seen the meaning of particles, time evolution or sampling, the interactions, and now with the Langevin equation, um, the most basic scheme um, to introduce a thermo thermodynamical ensemble, namely um, simulating at constant temperature. <clears throat> um, as the conclusion of this talk, I would like to show a handful of very basic analysis techniques, um, mostly those that you will be needing for the tutorial in the afternoon so that you have like seen them once. <clears throat> um, so what simulations can provide um, as opposed to experiments is often two things. First, you have exact knowledge about the system. And second, you can um, control the systems in ways which are often experimentally more difficult. And so like the first analysis technique that I want to show is that like, like really based on on the fact that you have exact knowledge of the system. Um, this is from a magnetic system, just because this is my field of research. It shows like um, um, a two-dimensional system of magnetic particles. Um, you see that clusters can form, and then Espresso also has algorithms to do statistics um, on these clusters. So this is a technique where you directly use the positions of the particles, which you know exactly um, to calculate um, properties from them. Still. Um, Using the positions of the particles, I want to familiarize you with the concept of a radial distribution function. Um, this is a very important um, quantity because it tells you something about the structure of the system. So it's calculated in the following way. Um, you go through each particle and then sample into a histogram um, the probability of finding another particle um, at a given distance. And you plot this probability versus the distance that you average over all particles and over, also over, over many times in the system. And then you get curves like these. Um, this is for particles just interacting with the Leonard Jones fluid. And um, from these functions, you can often directly observe, for instance, how much layering there is in the system. If it's a crystal, you will have very sharp peaks here and different crystal structures have the, pos the peaks at different positions. So like by looking at the RDF experience, people can tell what crystal structure it is. Um, and there's also um, like further more advanced techniques how you can, for instance, calculate compressibilities and quantities like these from the radial distribution functions. So it's also a very like, it tells you something about the structure of the system. Um, but it's also a starting point for further um, analysis techniques. Um, something else you can, of course, do is look at the time evolution. Um, now, this is just like the time evolution of a single of a single observable. Um, one one thing I want to point out here is that um, subsequent measurements are not uncorrelated, as you can see. So. The time resolution of the simulation is often rather good to, to make the trajectory smooth. And that means if you take samples that are um, shortly after each other, they are not independent from each other. And that is a, um, something that you have to take into account when you want to estimate your simulation errors, um, for which there will be also a separate uh, lecture later today. Now, combining spatial and um, temporal properties, I want to introduce mean square displacement. So this is one of the two important techniques used to calculate diffusion coefficients. So due to the thermal fluctuations, the particles move around over time. 
and uh, the diffusion coefficient tells us basically um, how fast that is. So what you do is you keep track for each particle um, over time where it is, and then you calculate the average on how much a particle has displaced over a certain time. Of course, going to the left and going to right is equally probable. So the average displacement um, is zero because left and right average is out, but the average square displacement does not average, average out. So this is what is what is plotted here. And you can like directly calculate it from observing the trajectories of your particles. Um, so for normal diffusion, like free diffusion and in, in bulk, um, this relation is, um, um, is linear. And then like if your particles have some mechanism of propulsion, you have a larger exponent. And if there's something like blocking diffusion, like for instance, um, when the when the geometry is constrained, you might also have um, a, an exponent lower than one um, in this law. So you calculate this, I guess, um, also in the afternoon or during the school several times. There's a second technique um, for calculating diffusion coefficient, which you'll also see, which is the green Kubo method, which um, which depends on analyzing velocity fluctuations. But I'll I'll not discuss this right now. Okay, so um, this very brief overview I want to summarize. Um, so we, in particle-based simulations, always describe our system as a bunch of interacting particles. Um, and a key question is what these particles represent. For instance, atoms or group of, group of atoms in, in atomistic simulations. Um, colloids or parts of polymers and coarse grain simulations, and then also coupling points to continuum solvers or for soft elastic surfaces um, in like more advanced um, simulation models. You have seen two techniques, students' equation of motion to calculate the time evolution or the Monte Carlo methods with the Metropolis algorithm. It's, it's like main representative um, to calculate statistical ensemble averages um, for this um, system of particles and their interactions. So there's a bunch of technique to have thermodynamic ensembles. Um, for instance, the Langevin equation, which introduces like friction and thermal noise to get constant temperatures, but also more advanced methods, which keep um, constant pressure um, um, or um, constant chemical potential. So in terms of interactions, the Lennard Jones interaction is like the workhorse, which provides basic repulsion between particles and, and uh, if you want also van der Waals um, attraction. And then there's the long range interactions for like electrostatics, magnetostatics, hydrodynamics, which decay so slowly that you basically have to calculate them collectively for the entire system uh, with, with advanced algorithms. So this is the like very basic summary. I realize it's a lot in a short time, but this is like should get you started. And in the afternoon, uh, you'll be run your first simulation with Leonard Jones particles. So you get to try out these concepts and practice. Thank you.